Good morning everybody. Welcome back to Sunday. Well, a Sunday we weren't going to have anyway because we were <laughs> going to be finished today. But uh, didn't happen, so now we have to continue with what we've got. So we're going to get it finished today, hopefully. So we've got only a few things to do. We don't have very much to do. We've got to put a finish on the box and I want to go through that with you. And then we've got to fit, fit the door onto it. So just just a few small things to, to just to tidy up the box and just show you what it looks like when it's finished. And then we're going to go through um, how we got the plan from beginning to to the end. So we'll, we'll, we'll work on that. Before we start though, um, Derek Lark sent me a, um, a revised edition of his Lark tool. And what he's done with it is he's put on a little finger stops. So these are, are basically spring-loaded finger stops that you can use to adjust and just make sure that you've got things in the right place as you're setting up your measurements. So a little finger stop there and a finger stop there. A bit hard to see with the black. Oh, there you are. So when we do it the other way, um, it's a matter of pressing this one in through here and it does go in there maybe I have to come in from this direction yep okay so my finger stop is for, for along the ruler is this one here so just a little addition that makes things look a little bit more interesting a little bit more user friendly so um, if you're interested in purchase, purchasing one of those Derek's um, Derek's details are on the bottom of uh, or down in the information box below us, and just have a look, scroll down, and you can get his information things. But if Derek's watching, he can always put his um, his email address up, and you can contact him for a, a new version. If you have the old version, or if you don't have a version at all, you can always get uh, get one from him. Really handy little tool. So that's my advertising for the day. Well, nearly. So now what I want to do is I want to get on with um, um, detailing our, our box. Now, I better take these out before, before I break one. Okay. I've, I've completed the inside of the box. You can see when you look at the inside of the box, you can see it's, it's quite shiny. Well, not shiny, it's just got that natural sheen to it. Right. Um, bright finish that you get when you get an, a really nice clean piece of timber that's been polished well. So all the inside has actually been done. So I don't need to do any more work to the inside, but the outside, if you look at the outside, you can see it's, it's nice and flat and it's got a sort of a sheen to it, but it's still relatively dull. So what we need to do is we need to tidy that up. Now, part of the reason that it's dull is because it got wet when I put the first coat of finish on it. And what that's done, it's raised the grain. When you raise the grain, you get all these spiky little bits of, uh, of uh, timber, the, the edges of the pores, they actually stand up on their end like that and they stick up through the, through the finish. And that's what gives you that rough surface. So what we need to do is we need to get rid of those and fill in any spaces around those small pores. Now you can't see them because they're rather really, really small. And this is how this is how I do mine. There are two ways I do mine. First of all, what I can do is I can use a piece of wet and dry 2000 grit sandpaper and I can give a, give the, the the box another another sand. But when I do that, if I was using the 2000 grit sandpaper, I'd be using the finish as a lubricant. Just that's one technique that you can use. Now, the other technique is this one. I'll need to set up for this, so I've got to take a couple of things off the bench. Just put myself down the platform. You can see that the uh, the platform is actually a little bit oily. It's the one I use all the time for the oil. And 
a handy hint. All always clamp things down when you're using them on the bench. It actually stops things moving around. Um, things don't slide about. So help stop if you're going to use something, help stop spills. Helps you stop spilling your stuff and yeah, makes it easy. Okay, and as well as that, it keeps the bench clean. So there's my box. Now the finish that I'm using is the Constantia Chinese wood oil. And as I've said to you in the past, for those of you who haven't seen this before, <coughs> this detail, this is just an advertising advertisement for, for Constantia by the sound of things, doesn't it? Um, you can contact Constantia again. There's uh, details below, um, but if you were use the word Coles Special and you spend 50 bucks, you can get a 5% five, 5 discount and you also get a um, free sample of another product. Okay, so they have a number of different products. Talk to Summer, there's a phone number there. Talk to Summer, she will help you out and she's happy to have a, have a chat. Um, so, have a, have a look at that. This, this is what we use, and this is how we use it. So first thing, get yourself a jar. What I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be using um, pumice for my grain filler, and it also is going to scrub off any um, raised grain as well. So a little bit of Chinese wood oil. Get some of that in the jar. Now I haven't got very much in there, just a little bit. Now, pumice powder. And it's very, very fine. You can see, you can see this, it's like flour. So, put a bit of that in there. Now, how much you use is up to you. Some people like to use a lot of it. Um, your uh, ratios for your finish is generally something that you have to work out. So look at it, test it and see. Exactly, test it and see as Pammy says. I'm going to stir that up. Can you feel the grit when you're rubbing it on cock? When you're rubbing it on you can feel a little bit of grit. You can feel it scrubbing. And you can see now, look at the colour of it, you can see it's it's sort of shadowy. It's not a clean finish anymore. Yeah. And it's got and if you can see into the jar, you can see that it's sort of mixed up quite nicely in the jar. So I, I've put in three little scoops of it into a small amount of, of the Chinese wood oil, and I'll give it a try. If it doesn't work for me, well then I'll just add some more pumice. Let's get that out of the way. Now when I'm using it, what I've done is I've created a nice little scrubbing ball. Okay, all it is is some rag wrapped up in another piece of rag with a cable tie on it to give me a, a nice little pad. Let's get this out of the way. Now putting it on, just going to put a little bit on, stir it up with a little brush. Oh, here's a little hint. My jar is quite big, you know, I can put put the lid on and it'll keep it for a little while. The brush was too long for the jar, so I just cut the end off the brush and now I can <laughs> keep it in there all the time without having to waste the brush. So this is the technique I use. I'm just gonna get it in a place where I can use it. And we can see it. And we can see it. Okay, I can feel just by putting it on with the brush I can feel the pumice on there. And again, this is an experimenting thing. You need to to experiment with a little bit. Now, um, elbow grease. So all I'm going to do is using what we call the French polishing technique. Now I can use it in figure of eight, or I can go into little circles. And I'm basically working along the grain.
and you can see I basically just rubbed that oil straight into the finish, into the top of the box. And when I feel it, I got quite a nice little, you can see it's actually got quite a nice little sheen on it there now that it didn't have before. So, get a little bit of that done. You'll notice that on some of the um, finishes that you have, or some of the timbers that you have, the oil will take up more on some timbers than others. I've noticed that um, on the silver ash, I did a little box the other day and it took forever for the silver ash to soak up the Chinese wood oil before I could actually get to a stage where I could French polish it or give it a, a scrub. Now if you listen carefully, I'll stop talking in a sec, you can actually hear that scrubbing the surface. So I've obviously got enough Chinese, uh, enough promising Chinese wood oil there. you also notice I didn't do the bottom of this one. You can see on the bottom, you can see the difference between the finish on there and there. And there is a reason for that. If I want to stick a piece of baize on the bottom, and if you go through this process on your finish, the baize won't stick. So that's coming up quite nice. So would you say that this is the beginning of a burnishing process? Um, but, or not until you was that, further was that along. a question? No, my question. Oh, your question. <laughs> uh, burnishing, burnishing means creating heat. And we can, we can use a burnishing technique on it. I tend up to try that with this stuff. Um, and it doesn't get that hot anyway because I'm not that quick or I'm not like a machine and I can't get enough speed up to create the heat on the timber. But this is uh, this is basically just scrubbing the surface off and getting rid of all of those little um, fibres that are standing up filling any grainy imperfections that you might have, giving you a nice clean flat surface. It smells lovely. Pammy says it's got quite a nice odour. Wouldn't wear it as a perfume but it's got a quite, quite a nice odour and it gives you that impression when you pick up a piece of a piece of work you can feel you can smell the timber in it or the, or the finish actually enhances the smell of the timber and then we have the back of it the back of its much larger surface you can actually see there against that surface you can see the how much pumice is actually in that not overdoing it just a little bit My pad, you'll find that when you make these pads, they tend to, to wear out relatively quickly when you're using the pumice. Because the pumice is uh, abrasive. tends to wear through the rag. It's sometimes when you do a job like this, the back looks nicer than the front. Depending on what timber you're using. That's a beautiful piece of timber. Incidentally, this piece of uh, rose mahogany that got on the back of it was uh, a piece of timber that I collected from around this region here. It was cut down, um, I think the tree was cut down in about 1890, 1900. So it was lying in a gully. 
and uh, we collected it out of the gully. A friend of mine found it and um, it was quite a big rose mahogany tree. And even though it had been lying in the gully for a hundred years before we got it, we still cut three tonne of timber out of it. So quite a bit of that was moisture and mud and stuff but there was still a significant amount of timber and this is the colour it was when we, when we actually collected it. Unfortunately I don't have any of it left. I used it all over the years. We cut it down in 1989. Oh, we, we cut it up in 1989. Okay, so that basically finishes the cabinet. It's all the bits comes off it. So just make sure you wipe it nicely. And you can see it's actually got this lovely sheen about it now. Because all of those fibres that made it look furry before have actually been taken off it. Tilt it, yeah. tilt it back forward. Yeah, you can see the sheen on it there now. That's just that's just from doing that process. Just hold that it. I did. Hold it. You can grave the back of it as well. Make it look quite nice. Graham Bell, that's the second week in a row you've been late. What's going on, sir? <laughs> so all I'm doing now is I'm just going over it with a clean piece of cloth just to get rid of any residual <coughs> pumice that might be sitting on there. Okay, so now my next step is to put on a coat of oil and let it sit for a little bit. So top on that jar. I have another jar that has straight Chinese wood oil in it and you can see the difference between what the clean wood oil looks like and the wood oil with the pumice in it. You can see it's much cleaner, much clearer and we're going to put a coat on. I'll use a bigger brush this because it's a bigger surface. I'm just going to brush lots on. Summer assures me that this is an organic stuff, that it's um, food friendly. So you can use it on various kitchen utensils. I think nowadays we sort of tend to sort of chase around after non-toxic finishes. We don't um, with with our, a lot of people are, uh, with allergies and and to some of the finishes that we were using in the past. Now that looks nice and shiny. It's not going to be that shiny when I'm, when it's dry. It's going to dull off a little bit and you can already see I don't know if you can see it on the on the camera there are there are patches here and I can see them here that are already started to soak up the, the oil can you see that little strip through there there it is yeah. there you can just see it there yeah. where the brush is so what it's doing is now it's still soaking up lots of oil And I want it to soak up as much as possible. So we'll give it a, a really good coat. Over the top. Silver, uh, silky oak tends not to soak up lots. And I think it's because the medullary rays are a cross grain rather than along the grain. And they tend to sort of do a, have a little blocking technique or blocking um, action. So it may not. That may be a reason, I, I, I don't know, 
I would have to test it a bit more to find out why the oak, as we know the Edmondale raised in the oak, go across the grain rather than along the grain, whereas in um, any other, all the other timbers, the Montgomery raised run along the grain. Okay, so we let that sit. Now I'm going to let that sit for, a, say, 10 or 15 minutes while we go through the next couple of steps. Oh, I need to do the door. <laughs> I'd forgotten about that too. Yeah. Now I've already scrubbed the door and you can see the difference. You can see it's, uh, it's lovely and flat, but it's just flat. And it's not, it hasn't got that natural sheen that I like. So it's a matter of putting a coat on there. Somebody asked me about, or somebody made comment last week about magnets. The, the there's a couple of schools of thought on magnets and how many magnets you should have and how how you should use them. Yeah, one school of thought is um, as our viewer last week mentioned was put a magnet in one side and a piece of steel in the other. Well, that's all very fine. Somebody's decided to call us. <laughs> um, somebody has, uh, sorry, th that's all fine putting a piece of steel on there, but if, um, if the rust appears, you end up with a little rusty washer, unless of course you use a galvanized washer. On the, um, appears on your on your on your, your project after a while so that's one problem that can occur the other one is when you look at my magnets here i have just a little round piece of steel rather than a flat washer with a screw in the middle of it and i think visually that looks a little bit nicer and then there was always also the comment and I think Dave Stanton was the one that said it, I'm not quite sure, I, I have to go back and have another look, that the magnets aren't that strong. They're only weak magnets and, and when you think about the objects that you have in the box, you don't want the door coming open because it's let go of The catch. So that's a number of different reasons why I like to use two magnets, a little bit stronger as well. The other thing is um, if you're using a piece of a, a little washer, the, uh, the cost it's a bit more expensive to use four, four than it is to use two. But it's only a minimal cost, so not something that um, would break most people's backs. Okay, so we're up to there. So now, Nicole, um, Ozzy wants to know, do you ever use a sanding sealer? Generally I don't use sanding sealer straight away, Ozzy. Um, I used to use it in the past because <clears throat> the sanding sealers are generally uh, have a dryers in them and they tend to be a, a, a poison and I sort of like I was saying earlier I tend to sort of steer away from that to um, to try and make sure that um, you know we're not using poisons all the time um, and I think that's probably a, an age thing I, I prefer to sort of at least keep my health in a little bit of good order so it's uh, yeah, something you should think about. Sanding seal is generally a really good base under uh, plastic finishes, um, lacquers and, um, uh, and enamels and things like that. Generally not underneath this stuff here. 
Okay, where were we up to? Now, next step. I'm going to have to shift this off the bench because the next one might be a little bit, might cause it to fall over. And you can see that is still uh, quite wet. It hasn't, hasn't soaked up a lot of it, a lot of the finish, but it, it's going to be really nice when it's done. Okay, so the Constantia finish, they, I've just used the pumice oil and the Chinese wood oil. They do have a number of different products. The other one of their products is this one here, which is um, just Lincoln Furniture Wax. Alright, now, there's lots of ways of using this, but I'll just show you the way that I'm going to use it. If you look at it, it's it's quite a quite a soft. Just coming on the on the thing, it's quite a soft wax. It's not it's not a heavy wax. It's not a hard wax. It's quite a soft wax, and it doesn't give you this high gloss shine that some waxes will do for you. And there are different waxes on on the on the market. One of the other waxes that we use that I have used in the past which is actually quite a good wax and this one different configuration it's called Pete's Polish it's a beeswax compound and it's a little bit harder and I can use that on that it's 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 quite a good wax it's it'll go over pretty much anything but um, I'm giving this um, and stand here one a bit of a bit of a whirl to see what we can come up with in some of our and see how it lasts on our, our projects now what I've done is I've waxed, this is the, uh, this little box went through the same process as the big box and you can see it's got the same sort of gloss on the inside, it's quite pretty on the inside, it's different timbers of course which means that the take up rate for the, the oils was probably a little different. I've waxed the top of it, I've waxed this side of it, I'm just going to show you how I wax the other one. So put soft cloth down on here so that I can lay it on there and you can see when you can come in on that one can you, you can see it, it's sort of a little dull and that's because it's taken up all the oil that was was there and what we need to do now is give it a light wax now you can do it by hand so all I can do is just scoop a little bit of wax on give it a really good scrub and work through that but it's a bit warm today to do that so I'm going to use a couple of Merca tools. Now little Merca um, polishing pad. The pad on it is actually a rupees product. Now Sydney Tools sell rupees products and you can buy these at, at, um, at Sydney Tools. They look like that that's the box they come in. So just rupees. The unfortunate thing about these is they are expensive. They're very expensive for what they are. It's just basically a Velcro pad on the back of a piece of sponge and it fits straight onto the little merker. So a little bit of wax and you can see I haven't got very much at all. Just a tiny little bit of wax and use my sponge pad as an applicator. A little bit more. Now I'm not using much. I don't want to overburden it and have something that's really sticky and hard to remove. And all I'm doing is just applying the wax and rubbing it in. You can also you can actually see the difference in the colour. Okay, so that's enough pressure pushing pushing it into the into the pores. 
and I have another little Merca tool. This one's a little bit bigger and it's got a bigger pad on it. Okay, so that's just a, a, a lamsel pad. And all I'm going to do now is just polish it off. Makes light work of it, doesn't it? Yeah, just makes it a little bit easier by you doing that. You can do it by hand if you like, but like I said, it's too hot. I'm going to work up a sweat. And you can see the difference in what that was before and what it is now. It's beautifully smooth and silky feeling. And I've got to do the back of it as well. So. Quite therapeutic doing this. Just getting it on. The wax rubbed in, and then we push. I could leave it sit for a little while before uh, before I wax it, before I polish it. But we don't have time on the show today, so I'll give it another wax later down the track. But basically what I'm trying to do is fill the pores with waxes and oils. It gives the, gives the timber a lot more life. It actually makes it look like what it looked like when you cut down, when you cut the tree, tree up. You can see now, you can see that shine on that. It's just, yep. it's just a brilliant natural sheen on what well, essentially could be a dull, a dull piece of timber. And when you look at that, you can see it's just got that, just that lovely natural finish on the, on the job. So that's basically that box finished. Okay, well, let's bring the other box back. Where did I put it? Just walk in behind Tammy there. Okay, so. You can see the difference now that that's been sitting just for a little bit and you can see the difference in the finish. It just looks like it's just got a, that natural sheen now. It'll get a, a wax and a polish later. But even after using the pumice, that flat, that flatness that it, that it created is actually gone because the finish is enhanced timber. Ooh. So <coughs> Skip was saying that the cost of the Merca, the little Merca hand tools, so just a bit cost prohibitive, and that he would probably use a drill or uh, some sort of orbital tool to put the head the head on. That's just as effective, isn't it? It certainly is, Skip. Um, you've hit on a good point there. I was going to mention it earlier. The the Mercas um, are relatively expensive. They're they're, they're exceptionally good, though. Um, and I know here in Australia, the, the guys, the guys who sell them, um, will look after you if you're a little bit budget conscious. But you can use a drill, an angle drill, and I have a couple of them that I use on the lathe, and a little pad 
I might actually get it out because I know it's, it's not that far away and I'll just show you what you can do or what you can use it. Just wipe this excess off. It just proves that there are many ways to approach an issue, aren't they? Yes, yes, you're right. It's, and that's something that we say all the time, Pam yeah. and I, when we talk to customers on, over the phone or anything like that, the, there's more than one way of skinning a cat and ours is not the only way. There are lots and lots of different ways. You can see how nice that is now. So just give me two seconds and I'll just round up this a couple more bits of equipment. You were talking about different types of drills and things like that. This is just a little Makita one that I have. Um, and if you're looking for the little pads, you can purchase these here in Australia. You can purchase these from Jimmy Carroll down in um, um, down Victoria. And same thing, that just sits on there. So, and as you can see, you can get the bigger, the bigger discs. Let's just Velcro it on there. And the point is, you might as well use something that you've already got in your workshop with yeah. a couple of accessories to have done. Okay, so this will do exactly the same thing as my little mocha. You can see I can get exactly the same result. One of the restrictions of it is that I'm plugged into the wall and the machine is a little bit heavier than the Mercury one, Mercury one but pretty much does exactly the same result, same job. And now if I just want to change it, well, I'll just change my pad. So as you can see, there are more ways to skin a cap than what we show you. Okay, so my next task for this one now is to put the bottom on it. I have a piece of base. And I'm using green base, you can use any colour you like and it's just a matter of cutting it to fit and I make sure that I've got a little excess of timber showing around the edges and that's, that'll actually get taken up with a bit of finish when we do the, the final bit of waxing and finishing. You don't need to use base, you can just have it there if you like depends on where you're going to put the box but it's all part of that it's all part of that putting together a plan designing designing the box to suit the purpose then constructing the box it's really nice Now, when I put that on there like that, all I'm going to do now is I'm going to swipe that over the edge of the bench. It just helps it to embed it onto the job. And then we 
have that. Lovely fit. My next task is to fit the door. Just shifting things around here. More so, move that. Now I'm putting it together, but I'm going to wax it again later, but not today. So I'll do it um, probably next week. Just give it a bit of chance to, to the oils to settle. Now my hinges. Now when I was fitting this, what I did with the thing was I labelled the hinge so that I knew exactly where it's going to go. One of these cheaper versions, the holes aren't always in exactly the same spot. So I fit the hinge and then label it as I fitted it to make sure that it goes in exactly the same spot that I had it when I was fitting it, doing our test fits. I probably should have polished the hinge before I fitted it which is what I normally do. Okay. So I'll have that. The screws that I've got for the door are actually smaller than the ones I've put in the cabinet. Basically because we don't want them to go through the door. I've got that big pudgy finger and little screws syndrome. Okay. Let's see how we go. Perfect. Perfectly flush all the way around the door. And you saw how that actually works with the with the double magnets. It got to there and then it just wanted to close itself. So it's actually quite quite tight. Um, and actually keeps our glasses quite safe. Now I've just got to put the other screws in. So putting one screw per part of the hinge and doing a test, doing putting it up and doing a test, it, it gives you somewhere to go if you need to make adjustments, I gather. Correct. The reason I only put one screw in at a time, it's a bit long, the one screw at a time is if the door doesn't fit properly, I have 
a space. My second hole is not being drilled, so I can adjust, set up the second hole, take the screw out of the first one, use the second hole to adjust to the right, adjust to the right space. Screws not straight. And then I can go back and plug the errant hole. For those of you who haven't seen it, this is a little, it's got a tiny little drill bit in there, not very long. I've got it backed off of a fair bit so that I don't drill a deep hole um, and the tape at the end of the end of the of the shaft is actually taped to fit into the taper on the on the front edge of the hinge. Quite sure that one is actually correct, but we'll soon find out. So, the drill bit that you just use to create that tiny hole, you can buy those, can't you? Yes, you can buy them yeah. separately. Yeah, you can buy them at the hardware store. Yeah. They're the little ones. Now we have a perfectly fitting door. I can now peel the tape off. The tape's only on there to protect the glass, or to protect the perspex. We don't want um, scratches. And we don't want it covered in finish. It's just painter's tape too, it's not, uh, it's not anything fancy. I found that the, um, the plastic covering that comes on the, on the Perspex when you buy it tends to fall off, it gets caught in your tools and all that sort of stuff. So I'm adding the tape. What am I saying now, eh? Hey? A great reveal. A great reveal. Let's put the glasses in there. Now apart from apart from a final wax, which will happen next week, our little cabinet is pretty much finished. marks on the perspex but basically that's what we have a finished product now we've got five minutes left in that five minutes I just want to go over what we did in the planning so let me put this aside okay, so I'll get rid of everything here I thought we wouldn't have this much time but anyway Managed to fill up the hour. 
I hope you've learnt something out of this because basically the whole premise of this activity was to was about planning a box. Now, when we started planning the box, we started with a rough sketch. Okay? So that was our rough sketch, our rough plan. So just an orthographic drawing with a, with a little isometric sketch up on the top there to give us some sort of visual effect and a few notes on um, on the cabinet itself, a couple of sides, a couple of sizes and so forth. So we started with that. We then went into this stuff here. Now I'm not going to go over the whole dot, all the details of it, but I will show you the progress or the process that we went through. So we had our, our drawing there and then we drew up individual parts. We started with, I've got to find it, I know it's here somewhere. There it is. We started with that one there, which was pretty much the what was on the board. So we started with that one. And then we had to put some bits and pieces in it. And we had a support shelf. We had the foot plate. And as you can see, they're pretty rough drawings. There's not a lot, uh, a lot of... Uh, uh, clean detail and then we had the door and so we had to come up with the door we've got a little sketch of, uh, of, of one of the panels the bottom plate the top plate different styles so we we had the, that put together we then came up with a parts list I've done it again I've got all the pages mixed up as you can see it's not in any particular order so there was our parts list so we came up with, with all the bits and pieces that we needed. I've written down the information on types of timber, silky oak, um, excess, uh, extra bits and pieces that we might need. And I even put together a tools list, and the list of tools that I might use to do, the, to do the project. All my router bits, my drill bits, all of the tools there. I haven't added in the hand tools yet, but that will get added in later. And during the process of doing this, I put together a written description. Now, when you write your description, keep your language simple. So if you look at number one there, it says, just cut two sides uh, of the frame panel for the box carcass, sand the inside of each of it. It's very simple instruction, just nothing fancy. There's no elaborate um, wordsmithing or anything like that. It's just a matter of getting down some simple instructions. And as you can see, there's six on that one there. There's another six on that page, and there's a few more on that. So I've sat down actually and written out all the information that are necessary to do that. Now, we have this lovely friend who's John Lafferty. You'll see, often see him on our show there, who um, is a real whiz on a, a, a CAD program. And he's come up with, just by discussing things with him, I've managed to be able to um, work out a drawing plan of that particular box. So the first drawing was the the um, was the the box in a completed form, just as an, a line drawing. The next part was an isometric drawing. That's these three drawings here. That's, oh, sorry, orthographic drawing of the cabinet. Now that's the one that you saw on the on the on the rough sketch. Beside that we've put the parts list so we've got all of the bits and pieces and they're the actual measurements of that box because I've given them to him. He then did an exploded view and this is something you would see in a, um, a magazine. Exploded view of the box itself where all the parts in situ where they go and that's the box, the cabinet. And then you would fi he followed it up with the exploded view of the door. So the piece of perspex the frame and so forth and then how do you put all that together well you need a working plan so there's the working plan of the frame you've got the, your sides you've got your ends you've got your back panel and positioning of all the dovetails 
<coughs> excuse me, and any other um, work that needs to be done on it. Then you have the internal componentry, again drawn up very nicely, and each of them is just a, a, a top view and a side view, showing positioning and hidden detail, so forth, and dimensions of all the bits and pieces. And then you've got the last one, which is the working plan of the door. So that's a very comprehensive, if I was to build that, that, um, this box again, I wouldn't have to go through the process that I went through for this whole, whole job. I've got all my plans here, I can just sit down and draw it um, and work, work another, another box exactly this way. And I will come up with exactly the same result as I've got here. So, getting through your planning, and um, if you are able to work with a, a CAD program, by all means you can draw it up and get, get a very professional look like this. Or even if I just used my plans um, that, I, that I wrote up all my rough sketching and all those sorts of things, I can actually do that. A, a friend of mine many years ago um, put together um, some of these programs and um, I, I don't know if any of you have heard of Neil Scobie um, or the late Neil Scobie. He was very adept at doing this, this sort of planning and I actually have some of his plans that he did and the process is exactly the same as I would have done anyway. So it's um, it's quite a simple process and if you're chasing around looking for something to do by all means make it up yourself someone else can benefit from your from your expertise and you'll learn a fair bit on the way through going through the process so have a go at it don't always rely on other people's plans because you might find that when you buy someone else's plans the measurements don't fit what you want it to do so you're going to have to adjust it anyway but the other thing is that if you are um, planning it, you can suit the project or the object that you're putting in the box or in the cabinet, whatever the case may be. You can deal with, with um, any uh, abnormalities that, that, that come along. The other thing is you learn steps and you learn different techniques as you go along. And that way um, your skill level is lifted and become a lot more confident in your workshop, a lot more competent in your workshop, and um, people start to go, wow, make one for me. And that's always a good advertisement for your, for your work. So please, have a go at trying some of the planning yourself. Um, go through that process. I hope you've learned something through this. But um, anyway, that's it. So give it a go. Um, you can always find that there's someone on the end of the phone that will, will help you with uh, if you get stuck with any part of it. So, yeah, try that. Now, we're going to have a break for two weeks. We'll be all back on the 9th of April, um, back with a new project. Pam has come up with a, a, a doozy that I've got to work on. So, um, we're going to have a little play with that and see if we can get, um, get a, a new project. So, mark your calendars, guys. 9th of April, we'll be back. Um, I've also got a bit of gardening I have to fix, so yes. we're going we're gonna to be doing a bit of, bit of work around the place. So have a good break everybody, oh, I'm going to have a good break, or maybe uh, I'll have a good break, but anyway, please stay safe everybody and um, if uh, you haven't subscribed to our channel, please subscribe and um, we'll get back to you on the night. Thanks. Had something to say. Yeah, thanks for watching everybody. We hope you enjoyed this project. And we'll I see you in two weeks. See you in two weeks. Is it the ninth? Come on. Is it the ninth?